everyone. Uh, welcome. So today we got uh, Dr. Michael Gerling, who is the site director of spine surgery at NYU Langone and an associate professor at NYU. He's board certified in orthopedics and has gone through a, a prestigious fellowship in spine surgery. And what we're going to chat about today is one of the things that uh, Dr. Gerling specializes in, which is endoscopic spine surgery. So it's really exciting. It's kind of uh, an emerging um, uh, new uh, tool in the surgical world in spine, and it's uh, not widely used or known to the healthcare population, both in the, the patient population and also in the physical therapy population, which is going to be excellent to kind of educate uh, us a little bit more about the details of the procedure, how it's used, uh, the subjective presentations that are ideal for, uh, and objective presentations that are ideal for, for uh, this type of procedure. So uh, welcome, Dr. Gerling. Any other introductions that I missed? No, that's great. Thank you for having me, Matt. Yeah, wonderful. So let's ju jump right in. So this first segment we're going to do is just talking about endoscopic spine surgery versus minimally invasive. I think there's a lot of confusion about what's minimal, minim minimally invasive versus traditional, and then what is endoscopic, because it's a very different procedure. Uh, and I think we got to enlighten the, the public a little bit about what that is. So take us through it. So the word minimally invasive is more broadly used and it's not just used in spinal surgery and it, the literal meaning of it sort of translates to the real meaning of it. It means that basically you're making smaller cuts and you're disrupting less tissue in order to, uh, in order to obtain your objective. For example, if you needed to remove something or, um, or place an implant or whatnot, that's your target but you can use a less invasive approach in order to minimize the collateral damage on the tissues. The endoscopic surgery uh, is in the spine world is very similar to the way cameras and scopes are being used in all the other realms of surgery in order to make it even more minimally invasive. So when one uses the word minimally invasive, it's a more broad term and, uh, and it typically includes using smaller retractors, more direct incisions that are uh, that re require less retraction of the tissues and less disruption. Um, with the endoscope, it is it is such a small fiber optic um, um, site pattern that you do not need to work around instruments, but rather you work right through the instrument. So rather than having a um, a, a traditional decompression surgery that might have a two inch incision where you strip muscles off the spine, a minimally invasive surgeon might use an 18 millimeter uh, tubular retractor in order to expose the exact same tissues. And with a camera, I would use a seven or eight millimeter incision and literally put a, uh, a camera through a small channel down to the target tissue and accomplish the exact same uh, objective. And, and that's something that's true in other fields of surgery as well. Even in orthopedics, people understand that originally we used to make open incisions to treat the knee. And now it's almost unheard of to make an open incision to treat the knee unless you were literally doing a knee replacement or replacing a part of the knee. Almost everything is done with cameras now. And the same thing is happening in a very exciting way in the spine world. Yeah, excellent. Yeah, it's it's funny. I remember seeing, you know, in the career I meant I remember early when I was, you know, uh, probably back in about 2006, 2007, I remember the first minimally invasive hips and knees came out and we're like, oh, you only have to spend three days in the hospital. And that was like huge. And now now we got, you know, an overnight or just an outpatient visit, which is excellent. So it's the same thing that's happening here, right? So less tissue disruption, less blood loss. And, and there's a, a cosmetic component, so improved cosmesis with this as well, right? Yeah, cosmetic. Uh, definitely the incisions are far more cosmetic. Uh, I actually oftentimes use transverse incisions rather than the traditional upright incisions that surgeons use. Um, so we have the benefit of making incisions hide in the creases of your skin. Um, it's much more, it's much more cosmetic. But what's even more important is that because we're not disrupting as much tissue, your safe return to play, your safe return to your lifestyle and work and whatnot is expedited. So I have patients 
routinely undergoing lumbar fusion procedures, for example, using endoscopic technology, where they literally walk out of the hospital within a couple hours of the surgery um, after they've recovered from the anesthesia, quite frankly. I've even done these surgeries under conscious sedation, even two level lumbar fusions under conscious sedation, meaning that we don't even have to put them fully to sleep because there's so little disruption and we can just numb up the tissues just like a dentist would and accomplish the same objectives, really. So it's a real blessing. Yeah, that's great. And I think that's another when we're talking about indications, right? What, what you know, there's some patients that are very fearful of general anesthesia and um, or can't go under general anesthesia for a variety of reasons. So um, it, this is really the only way to do these types of procedures without without uh, general anesthesia, correct? Um, well, I mean, people do things, but, <laughs> but in general, in general practice, it is really quite unusual for somebody to have uh, an aggressive uh, or invasive procedure without general anesthesia. Um, in, even in the, in the world of, um, of sports surgery where they're putting cameras in, a lot of the time they're using general anesthesia. In that world, it's a little bit easier to numb up a certain area with blocks and different anesthesia maneuvers, just like a woman when she gives birth can have a spinal done where she's still fully awake, but she can't feel anywhere uh, where the trauma is happening. And in our world, it is really unusual for uh, an invasive procedure to, to be numbed up, like purely numbed up. Uh, completely numbed up where you wouldn't feel it and you wouldn't move and you would tolerate it well. Um, but luckily now with this technology, there's so little disruption of the tissues that patients can be partially awake. It's similar to having a colonoscopy. Um, when people have colonoscopies, they don't typically have intubation and general an anesthesia. They oftentimes just have medication, so they don't remember any of it. Um, but they're awake, they can talk, they're breathing on their own. You can imagine that that has a lot less impact on your recovery as well, especially patients that are fragile, elderly patients and whatnot that undergo conscious sedation procedures. They're far less apt to have problems with their lungs afterwards, problems with their, um, with their mental status, confusion, delirium, things like that. And, and that translates to all of us, just like you wouldn't want to take really strong medications if you can avoid it. This is taking less medications to accomplish your surgical goals. Yeah, excellent. So there's, it sounds like less of a lot of things, right? Less tissue disruption, less blood loss, less, um, a, a, you know, a decreased healing time. Uh, so there's a lot of benefits to this. So let's, you know, look, we're, we're going to get, you know, more into detail into the actual comprehensive procedure itself about actually how you do this instrumentally. Um, but but in, in this in this segment, Let's just kind of wrap up by talking about what, what are some of the specific procedures you actually do and, uh, endoscopically. So at this point, having done endoscopic surgery for about seven years, um, almost 100% of my decompressions are done using the scope. Early on, surgeons will be appropriately cautious using it and only use it for very um, limited indications, for example, a disc herniation that's on the side of the spine where they don't actually have to enter the canal. But once you become proficient with it, you can expand those indications. And now I do almost everything with the camera. So it doesn't matter where the, the target is, I can get to it with a small incision and with the camera. Now that doesn't mean that I do everything with the camera and there are situations where it's less efficient too. So even though I can do it, it doesn't mean that I, I, would, I would recommend it. For example, somebody who had a lot of sites of compression or deformity, in order to go to each individual site with the camera, it would be a lot longer and, and more inefficient than it would be to just put down one tubular retractor that's 18 millimeters and, and, and have the same targets all accomplished yeah. within the same approach. So I do, I do use it appropriately, but there really is almost no limitation. So we do decompressions, we do discectomies, which means that we remove portions of the disc. Decompressions means that we take 
bone or joint or tissue off of the nerve elements in the spine. So if you're having nerve symptoms, it can be a real blessing to just be able to remove a little bit of the pressure so that you can walk better, you can move better, so that the nerves can breathe, so to speak, and, and you have less numbness and pain and, and weakness. Um, but now these indications are being expanded even more where I can go in to the spine with the camera remove tissues, clean things up, uh, perform a implantation of tissue or uh, of a device through uh, the small little camera and tubes so that I can actually accomplish fusion procedures through the camera as well, whereby we have extremely small incisions. And the incisions are only as big as really the devices that we have to put through the skin, not so much limited by the actual exposure and the actual removal of tissues. So, um, so it's really an amazing blessing there. Excellent. And is it kind of the same principle in terms of the invasiveness? If you had like a multi-level, you know, um, a spondylolisthesis with a little bit more, you know, clear signs of instability, is, is this something still in the wheelhouse of endoscopic or is this gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna need to do uh, another approach? It is, and it just depends on what I'm seeing. If I see that it's going to be very precarious, and that I um, that that I feel as though having um, larger instruments, um, different instruments go through the endoscope than go through a traditional tube or the traditional surgery. And so, depending on what instruments I need to use to correct the deformity, that would gauge how big a portal I need to get to that site. And if if it turns out that the portal is going to exceed the size of the camera, then it's sort of diminishing returns to use the camera sometimes. So uh, we use it selectively in those cases, just depending on what our our end objectives are, what our targets are, uh, you know, what, what uh, level of um, activity we have to have once we get to the tissue. Yeah. So sometimes we need a bigger portal, which means that you would need to have a larger, um, a larger cut, a larger tube. But, um, but really with the technology we have, the, the cut and the portal is really only dictated by the size of the implant or the type of, um, the type of tool that we need to use in there. Gotcha. And so most of the time you can accomplish things with the endoscope, but when we need to put something bigger in there, we use a bigger portal. Gotcha. Excellent. Very clear. So um, that's an excellent summary of kind of the, the, the basics of, of endoscopic versus minimally invasive. I think let's, um, we're going to, we're going to do another segment here, kind of really jumping into the, the procedure procedural aspect of this. So let's, um, uh, you know, tune in for that one. And, uh, but uh, Dr. Gerling, thank you so much for being here and just, uh, uh, reviewing this for us this is going to be great content for uh, for us and uh, enlightening for a lot of the, the, the medical population. Well, well, thanks for having me. Uh, I'll see everybody in the next recording, but, uh, but I, I really was honored to be invited. Yeah, wonderful. All right. We'll see you soon.